Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session, Technology for a Fractured World. Well, what better title to describe what is happening now, and especially the fact that here we are again on Zoom and enabled in our meeting and in our conversation by technology. There is no doubt that technology is pervading every aspect of our lives and work. And with the pandemic, our dependency on technology is even bigger. Do we live in a fractured world with or without technology? What can I say? I mean, of course, the internet is bringing us together, but I live here in Washington, D.C., and on everyone's lips here in this country, the cyber attacks have been in the past weeks. So, yes, technology can break the world as well and can even deepen the fractures at the geopolitical level as well as at the national level. Here again, the capital behind me, I witnessed an insurrection. I witnessed how social media and uh, politicians are using social media to use citizens in the contested territory. We have half of the people of this country on one side and half of them on the other side. What better description for a fractured society? Or a fractured nation. The purpose of this session is to look at more innovative ways to use technology, to design technology, to think about technology and to employ technology in order to do good in the world. It is clear that no new technologies are needed, but to use them better. Since uh, World War II, we have seen that the power of the atom can be the most destructive power in the world, but on the other side, the same power can bring us the energy that we need. Uh, how do we use technology for good? I have an amazing uh, group of panelists, of thinkers, of experts with me at the session today, and I will rely on them to answer this and a few more questions that I have prepared for them. But first, I would like to invite them to introduce themselves. Ramesh, please. Thank you, Mihaela. And really, what a unique time we live in. If you think about the Maslow's need, Maslow's hierarchy of our needs, you know, you know, the things that come to our mind right away are, you know, education, health, and the work. So the future of health, future of education, future of work are right at the bottom of the pyramid. And then I go up in those needs, we start thinking about self-esteem and things like democracy that you hinted at the beginning of this uh, of this call. So, you know, mm -hmm. I am Ramesh Pastor, professor at uh, MIT and also founder of the PathCheck Foundation. Uh, and about a year and a half ago, we realized that uh, we need a digital solution for dealing with the pandemic uh, so we launched this nonprofit from MIT called PathCheck Foundation, uh, raised a few million dollars and launched uh, contact tracing solutions based on smartphones. And after that, we have been working in many areas of the pandemic, creating privacy-preserving crowdsourced solution that really serves the need of a citizen, not just the needs of public health uh, and government. And it has been a humbling experience deploying the solutions uh, in many parts of the world. Coming back to the Maslow's hierarchy, I think the fracturing is happening because clearly the way we think about our health, our education and work is changing very rapidly. For me, one of the key aspect of the fracture is this discrepancy between people who have the data and people who don't have the data. But one level above that, people who have the data and ability to exploit it especially the big tech companies, for example, or public health entities and so on. And so we live in a world where we have the digital, not only a digital divide, but a computational divide, an AI divide, if you want to call it. So the fracturing is continuing because those with data and those with the ability to exploit it are you know, becoming worth trillions of dollars. On the other hand, governments who should be able to serve their own population or organizations 
who are mom and pop stores like whether you are a taxi owner or a hotel owner or a you know uh, a manufacturer you are being completely appended by an entity that doesn't own any taxis but is one of the world's largest or an entity that doesn't any own any hotels but you know is is airbnb and doesn't own any manufacturing but using the gig economy for it so this this fracturing this discrepancy is increasing over time in our humble opinion at mit and also at pastrek foundation the key piece of the puzzle had to solve is how can we create a privacy preserving all seeing all knowing omnipresent omnipotent ai system that can allow us to see the whole world while maintaining individual privacy and by privacy i don't mean consent or anonymity but by privacy you mean no information from a citizen is ever shared by anybody else other than themselves oh, and even then we're able to create this you know a global ai to serve yes. the needs so a to us reflection of humanity, of humanity and of the individuality yes so this That's ai right. i can already see it yes it sees me and i see myself through it and as well society and so on and then we can point to the fractures there is a, there was actually at least i worked on a project like that at the planetary level with the internet uh, when i was in europe with the european commission it is absolutely fascinating and uh, i hope this can help us um i would like to ask nag now to introduce himself and give us his take on the matter from his perspective right. <clears throat> thank you malia and uh, thanks for the opportunity and glad to be part of this uh, wonderful panel here today uh, for me the fracture world we are living in uh, before that i'll just uh, share uh, my background uh, i come from the financial services industry i'm based out in uh, new jersey and i work mostly in the new york city um uh, I, I work in the financial services industry at the global financial institutions. Uh, the fractured world from the financial services industry point of view, as I said, I live in Princeton, but I, draw, I go to the New York City. It's been 18 months. I actually trained uh, or, or, or went to the city. Uh, so things have changed uh, post-COVID. <clears throat> Uh, before that, I was in Davos in January, so it was a bit of traveling. Uh, but certainly, things have changed. Uh, how do we see the rest of the world working from home options? Um, in, in through my lens, financial institutions I think embraced um, very well compared to the 2008 financial crisis, where banks looked as a, uh, as, as a bad guys. Uh, in early 2008, in, in early 2000, when the dot com bubble, when we saw, um, and, and this particular pandemic, where the banks and the financial institutions actually uh, came out with a, a more um, a strong foundation to to meet the needs of the, the the rest of the world, I believe, not just in the U.S. but the rest of the world too. Uh, so that uh, I'll I'll follow up on your questions later. But that's part of how the fracture world, in my view, the financial institutions and how the technology disruption, especially we are supposed to be meeting in person somewhere in the Europe or in the New York City, uh, and we were live um, at the different, time, different time zones. So that's kind of a disruption. Um, but we, I believe we are all embracing uh, the disruption in a positive way, in my view. So I, I'll stop there. and. Uh, We'll, we'll follow up on a few questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, indeed, we adapt. What can we do? We want to be together. We want to have this conversation. So I know it's very late in Europe. And uh, yes, indeed. And thank you, everybody from Europe is joining us and including our panelists from there. So speaking of that, Felix, please give us your in introduction and, and uh, your view on, on the topic. Thanks, Marieta. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, I live in two worlds at the moment, professionally speaking. Um, I run an impact fund focused on probably one of the most fractured countries in the world, Afghanistan. We're the only financial commercial investor in the country, next to about 3,500 NGOs that are active in the country as well. We're the only for-profit commercial investor trying to show 
the impact on the economic development of a really fractured country by investing for profit in companies there. And obviously technology is at the forefront of what we're trying to achieve there, be it in the insurance sector where we're actively investing, be it in the technology sector, running data centers and others. And my second um, hat is uh, in the space uh, segment. So I'm chairing Europe's uh, uh, sort of um, only um, dedicated space technology fund focused on late stage growth opportunities. Um, and there again, it's, it's interesting to see how technology, in this case, space technology can actually help a fractured world quite specifically. And you know, happy to give some examples later on, in particular around climate change and environmental sort of monitoring, which is critical, um, uh, a critical or probably the most critical uh, activity. Uh, you know, if we're thinking about <coughs> fracture uh, of uh, of the world, so I'm, I might just leave it at that for now. Yes, yeah. and indeed, yes, and and when you're mentioning space and and how can we see the planet better from space, I I come back to. Uh, Ramesh's view. Yes, I have that AI which looks back and informs me not only about the impact of my behavior, but also what's happening in the world, uh, also in, in, in ecosystems and so on and so forth, which is also impact of my behavior. So amazing, amazing. And of course, I have many more questions for all of you, but I would like to move on to Richard. Please introduce Thanks, yourself Karen. and uh, your view on the matter. Thank you, yes, and it's interesting that you have two space people on this panel because as, as is with Felix, I, um, I'm a venture partner in a uh, space venture fund here in the United States, I'm based just outside Chicago, and I also run a space business development corporation that takes advantage of uh, new space technologies because um, when you try to keep a human being alive in space, it requires all of our knowledge. It's not just rockets and videos. It's everything you can imagine to keep someone alive. And from that, there's an enormous amount of um, research and development te uh, technologies of all sorts, you know, whether it's material science, it's communications, it's, it's uh, propulsion, it's health, medical, you know, whatever. So um, the space segment I see as one of the most exciting and fast developing areas of technology that we can utilize on a global basis. And you see this because of the uptick in um, space activities around the world. I, I would say on my comment on technology and the fractured nature of the world, um, I always like to kind of think that this is a generational thing. Um, technology is moving so quickly that basically, unfortunately, the, the generations that can't accept this incredible fast move they have to kind of pass away and the people who've taken that technology run with it uh, in order to make it uh, um, fully uh, innovative inside um, uh, the global population. But my, I also look at it from a historic standpoint of people say to me, oh, you know, when, there's, when there's a global crisis or there's a global meltdown in financial markets, they always go, well, it's different time. There's a, there's a bubble, but it's different this time. We're more intelligent. We have better tools this time. It's not going to be like 1929. My answer to that is, when did your DNA change? Because unless your DNA changes, it's still all fear and greed. And so that's the way I look at the way that the world has become fractured. I think that the ownership of information, which used to be fairly concentrated, whether it be uh, the, the big television broadcasters, you know, in England it used to be the BBC. And then ooh, along came the ITV. You had two channels, right? Uh, in America, there was a few more. That message is no longer uh, comported by these large organizations anymore. It's completely fractured and it's become a frothy bubble. And people want to be in their own little bubble and own their own little piece of information that they believe in. So that's the way I look at it. Yes, thank you so much. And you know, this brings me straight to uh, my own background, which is in technology and society. I'm a professor of computer science uh, with PhD in robotics, GAN <laughs> advisor to, uh, to companies and large and small. And my passion is, you know, related very much to the questions which you posed, uh, Richard, 
I mean, can we transcend our human condition? Can we use technology to help us do that? Increase our awareness, which brings me back to Ramesh and his AI <laughs> over encompassing AI global system that can help us hopefully, yes, do that and, and see ourselves and then realize, okay, well, maybe I can be better. Maybe I can do better in this world and have a better impact or, you know, a less harmful impact at a minimum. So I'm coming back now to Ramesh with the next question, which will be a question for each of you. Which are the main challenges that uh, we are facing in the way of implementing this dream, this AI, uh, you know, privacy preserving AI at a global scale that can enable us see better and do better? If you believe in this dream of a benevolent AI, you know, because AI is going to be a dictator of some kind, so we might as well have a benevolent AI. <laughs> And, That's what MIT um, is saying. We must believe it. <laughs> I know, right? And I mean, I mean, Felix made a point about you know countries like Afghanistan. Um, and in any technology in the beginning is always exploited by the leaders to you know um, make an you know create an advantage, unfair advantage. But over time, we hope that the technology diffuses widely enough so that you know most of the masses benefit from it. Uh, in the past, it has been done through regulation, uh, but I think things like AI are moving fast enough that regulations are always going to lag behind. So the only way to solve the problem with technology is to add more technology to kind of counteract it. Uh, so you, wouldn't it be amazing, Felix, if you know even a country like Afghanistan, given that you know significant part of the population still has a digital footprint through their smartphone, through their banking transaction, you know, uh, and, and so on. Uh, even if it's not consumerization of technology, they're still interfacing with technology. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we have this benevolent AI, you know, that can become this honest, impartial broker, you know, for health, for education, and so on? I mean, it feels like a dream because, you know, the on, on the ground realities, you know, the human values, the democratic structures are not in place. But, you know, I would dream for a world where AI solves not only you know, the bottom of the Maslow's pyramid of needs, which is education, health, and so on, but also starts playing a role uh, as we go up in the hierarchy. If I may intervene here, because actually what um, Richard pointed to was exactly the opposite, and that is how technology is deepening our weaknesses, and actually, you know, limbic hijack and addiction, and, the, and then preying on our greed and... and you know, uh, all this bad stuff, and we all know the effects in the world. So how do we transcend that? Is it possible? I, I, I'm mom. asking Ramesh and, and Richard. I mean, which, which <laughs> oh, of you would like? I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a quick pass and hand it over to Richard. I think, I think you know, there has to be, technology is not a solution for everything, and there has to be a public debate and, you know, public uh, discussion uh, around it. Uh, again, regulations will always uh, always fall behind, uh, and promoting innovation and entrepreneurship in this space might get us to at least some initial experiments that demonstrate you know what could be the right solution. And then it's up to you know our you know political and democratic leaders to say hey, that experiment seems to work really well, you know, in Estonia or in Afghanistan, and let's scale that you know elsewhere. Go ahead, Richard. I, I was going to say, Ramesh, that uh, one of your colleagues, Darren Asimolyu. Uh, who's an economist at MIT. He's one of my favorite authors. Uh, his book, Why, Why Nations Fail, is one of my favorite books as an economist. And I, I think one of the most important things we have to ask the question of is, are we, is this technology going to be inclusive or extractive? Mm -hmm. and, and if it's extractive, like you said, top down, it's like, hey, we've got control. We have all your information and we're going to use it however we feel is in your best interest or maybe in our best interest. And at the bottom end, you've got all these people who really don't understand the technology. They don't understand what it's doing, how it interacts with themselves in their own lives. They don't under understand how that technology reaches out to them, um, even though they're part of it and that they, can, they can have their phones and their TV and whatever, but they're not quite understanding what's how they're being manipulated. And so I think that unless the technology is inclusive and it makes it so that you are the arbiter of your own information, like they're trying to do in Europe, um, America is more interested in selling you stuff. 
That's why they want your information. They want to put you in a little box so they can go, I know how to market this product to you. I know how to sell you a, a pharmaceutical, right? In Europe, it's much more, uh, we want to make sure that your privacy is not used by these big American corporations because they're not really very European. And so they're trying to make sure that they don't have access to all this information about their, their denizens. And I think that... I, that I can sense down. the fracture in, in your statement. I don't want to interrupt you. I just want to point to the fact that Facebook is registered in Ireland. And that actually, I don't think this is an American or European matter. I, I agree that Europe is leading at the moment. But I think it's a corporate and more, but, which is probably from, even more dangerous or human. <laughs> from, a regulatory, from a regulatory standpoint, the American government looks at it very differently from the EU. Yes, yes. No, I, I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but yes, no, definitely. Thank you so much for reflecting back to us, actually, that we live in a fractured world. We are not on the same page. But let's hope that technology can enable us. So I'm going to invite Nag now to give us his perspective on the challenges and his hopes if technology can help us overcome those challenges. Sure, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take you to the financial services again, how the AI and the technologies are reshaping uh, the way we do transact. Uh, when I say the transact is mostly in terms of how your digital currencies are, are, are purely on your credit card processings, the AI is definitely uh, driving the change, uh, how we actually do the business, whether to the customers by the large financial institutions or even the fintech companies um, coming on board, helping these financial institutions, driving the new innovations. Uh, for example, um, how the customer data uh, is viewed, um, what are the customer patterns, their spendings, and how the customer conference index is, is being viewed in the US, which probably around six to seven trillion dollars of the entire GDP. Uh, so that's the key how the AI um, is, is looking at the large population of data sets and, and drive making the quicker decisions. Um, decision making process, including how your credit card applications, whether, uh, so in, in a large scale decision making where uh, hundreds and thousands of people uh, view the data uh, for, for X number of hours, the AI with the new technologies um, helping the institutions to make the decisions quicker, more effectively. Um, it, in, in, in terms of even uh, uh, companies like automobile industry, uh, autonomous vehicles, how we, we see in the future, uh, including how, the, how we are working, uh, working from home options or driving to the work locations. Uh, so the AI is definitely uh, in the forefront, maybe we are not there yet, but uh, instead of using the fractured world, I would say uh, more diversified and, and how uh, the ESG is shaping that AI, especially the governance model, which I advocate strongly uh, on the ESG front, where in the EU, uh, E&S is more uh, concentrated, and in the US, the governance G is more predominantly takes a leading role. So I think the AI will definitely drive that the governance and, and, and more of a uh, ESG framework. Um, hopefully when we're talking about the trillion dollar business in the next five to 10 years or 20 years, uh, how the ESG matrix will AI shapes that world. So I'm very optimistic in the future a better future rather than fracture work for today. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm, I'm going to move to Felix now. And, you know, there are two aspects which I'd like to deepen into with you, Felix, because so the space aspect, first of all, yeah. So it's, the, uh, it's big news and recent news now that Jeff Bezos is, has the courage to, to actually go there with his brother. So he's taking his family. It means that he really has a lot of trust. And also, uh, Richard was mentioning that technology is advanced enough to take us there and that it's so important to have precision when it comes to that kind of technology. 
And you see, I find it um, like a, such a huge discrepancy. Yes, like what will they see from there when they look at Afghanistan, right? So indeed, a fractured society, a fractured world. Can technology actually help in such places in any way? Or what is the solution there? Which are the biggest challenges which you see there as the first and only so far uh, impact fund located there, boots on the ground? I have, so I have two questions for you. I, Look, please address them in whatever way you want. I try to relate them. On, but, on Jeff Bezos and, uh, and colleagues, you know, I think we're going to see the top uh, five richest people in the world disappear in space pretty quickly. Let's hope <laughs> that most of them come back. They, <laughs> when they look Afghanistan, probably they don't this, want to come back. Watch, yes. <laughs> uh, watch this space, I would, uh, I would say. I was. I thought this is actually quite a brave move, and then obviously everybody else wants to go. So let's see. Let's see how things develop. You know, if and when the first uh, accident happens, God forbid. Um, but look back to Afghanistan, um, and it's interesting when you think about technology. You know, it's, it's obviously pretty basic uh, in Afghanistan, and it's pretty fractured, as I mentioned. So let's take the uh, you know uh, one sector of the economy, the mobile uh, phone sector. There are about five mobile phone companies. Um, Most of them, uh, you know, over the last few years, uh, generated most of the revenue uh, from the CIA telling them to send uh, targeted marketing messages to specific parts of the country. So please, can you send, you know, 100,000 uh, SMS messages to northern Kandahar or southern Herat province or wherever else they wanted specific messages uh, to be distributed? And then on the other side, you have got the Taliban groups who, who tell the mobile phone companies between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, you're going to shut down those 12 masks. And if you don't, then they're gone. Um, that's how technology is being used uh, in a fractured world. It's pretty... Bipolar, know. I would say. Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, it, it, it's, yeah. it's frustrating to, to some extent. But on the positive side, obviously, uh, technology allows communication distribution, not just sort of CIA type uh, communication, but proper communication between people, information sharing. There's a lot of peaceful protests going on in Afghanistan and also parts of Pakistan at the moment. And it's interesting and fascinating to see how they're using technology to organize themselves and, and communicate. And then if you then look on the other side, on the employment side, on the business side, so we've got a company, um, a technology company that runs the largest data center, has got a playout center, runs the only proper satellite uplink for TV channels. And they also do um, uh, provide services to TV channels around the globe. So they're at the moment uh, managing um, remotely through the cloud Ethiopia's largest TV channel in real time from the office in Kabul, Afghanistan. And, you know, it's, they have got a viewership of 55% in, in Ethiopia. Hopefully none of them uh, realize that, you know, their favorite programs are being run in real time from Kabul, Afghanistan. But it works and it creates employment and it creates opportunities and it creates interconnectivity. And, and seeing that is just fascinating and it's possible. And hopefully, you know, those opportunities will eventually also change and allow people to realize, you know, it's a much more connected world. I think we need to understand and technology needs to help to un us and make un us understand we're connected. Wherever we are, things are connected. Amazing. And really, uh, this helps me slide with the others because you already gave an example. I would like each of you, if you have one, to share with us such hopeful examples. Well, many, I mean, what Felix shared, it's hard to, to beat. But please, if you have any of those in which technology indeed, surprisingly, yes, I, I'm absolutely surprised by this example and also showing that, yes, it can bring us together and it can help us in ways which it, I think it just needs innovative thinking. And, well, maybe not just. This is a big deal, innovative thinking. The right, the right way to do it. Ramesh, do you have any hopeful examples? to share with us. I, I think there is a lot of hope and uh, it's fascinating to hear the examples from uh, from Afghanistan. Um, I, I think if we believe in doing experiments in low stakes environment, using mobility data uh, to deal with migrant population or to understand credit rating or using satellite imagery 
you know, to look at poaching and so on. So a lot of good examples you can see already uh, in using AI for, you know, kind of public good. Um, and we need to take those, you know, these low stakes experiments, uh, scenarios, and just put more, you know, more fuel behind it. I mean, I mean, Richard is a venture capitalist here, and he knows this very well. Uh, you have to, you cannot just give people series C, you have to give people seed grants uh, and, and see if they can go to series A. Um, I think governments are not good at doing that. You know, they can yeah. deploy things at the state level or nation level. Uh, but, you know, the entrepreneurial ecosystem can, you know, stimulate some of these experiments. I would love to see, you know, either you're an impact investor or, uh, you know, a traditional venture investor, whether you're a university or, you know, a unique online education program, you know, let's start c collecting those examples of how, how, how AI is being used uh, for public good uh, and, you know, make them more visible. I have talked to Frank about this quite a bit. Uh, at process and he's already doing uh, quite a bit of that uh, and we need more visibility i you know i have a team at facebook um and i will get uh, quite a bit uh, you know sometimes for wrong reasons sometimes for the right reasons uh, but there are other companies who who are significantly worse uh, in you know how they are thinking about not not intentionally but kind of just being you know, um, uh, you know, reluctant to acknowledge it uh, in in how how the services are getting uh, misused by others. Uh, and again, there's no there's no point in focusing just on consumer facing companies because it's easy to write about them in Wall Street Journal or New York Times. But there are many things, many companies that are invisible, you know, yes. who are really damaging uh, and creating a fracture. On the other hand, there are other smaller players who are doing great work, including you know, uh, if I had to plug some of our own work. Uh, here at MIT, so yeah, let's let's just let's just give them more, you know, more uh, airtime. Let's give them, let's shine more light on them. Yes, so they are an inspiration for us all. So now, uh, Richard, please, if you can give us some example or you know your thoughts with regard to such inspirational. Yeah, um, and what I'd like to point out is that, that there's, even though we have this interconnectedness on a global level. I think it still comes down a lot to culture and uh, obviously education. I have more, I feel I have more in common with a cubicle worker in Bangalore than I do with a cotton farmer in Alabama, right? Um, because of the way our, our minds think, because of the way we understand the modern world. And so, you know, we, we can take advantage of the technologies that are available to us and also the educational systems that are available to us if we want to make the effort. Now, now, I'm not saying that everybody's lazy or everybody you know, that a lot of people are lazy or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's it's an issue of, um, you know, do you want to be involved in the way that the world is going? And a lot of people don't, you know, they, they really don't want to be part and parcel of the, the massive acceleration in technological development. I mean, there are going to be so many new innovations in the next few years that a lot of us don't even see coming uh cr cryptocurrencies are going to be a massive thing and if central banks start issuing their own digital currencies what's that going to do to the banking system is it going to be more de democratic or is it going to be a question of oh now we can control all of our people by just giving them bad marks on their credit rating or whatever like that because they did something jaywalked you know like in china right you've got your social um, um credit global, yeah, score right? yeah and, and Thank so, you for bringing that up, because yeah, because yeah. you know actually uh, this is an issue. Uh, so I'm working on, on blockchain and on giving economic identities to, to those underprivileged or less uh, privileged, and Nag is working in the financial sector. So I'm I'm just curious, what is his take on cryptocurrencies? Is that maybe a way in which technology can help us in the future, mend the world, and reduce the inequalities? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is going to be a very interesting challenge. Don't quote me. So um, <laughs> I have my own opinion. Pretty strong yeah, about you, that. So okay, you know. Yeah, that. You know what? It's, I want to make it as my own, and and does it reflect? Uh, uh, I need to put the disclaimer. Chris, cryptocurrency, um, and, and I'll just give an example. Uh, as of today and the last weeks, the cyber data breaches that are happening. Yes. Both at the colonial pipeline 
and uh, the JBS, the, the largest meat uh, manufacturer. Um, so uh, yesterday's uh, the colonial uh, pipeline, the CEO at the, at the Senate committee, he said uh, paying that $4.8 million ransom was the right thing to do. Um, so you, you fundamentally question about the entire uh, transaction, which is not a cash transaction or a wire transfer. It is a crypto. Um, and they and, could break into a Bitcoin wallet, which worries me. <laughs> exactly. And, and I believe the Fed actually traced back and recovered a $2.3 million out of the 4.8K, yes. which is a good news. <laughs> It is good news in this case, yes. <laughs> it isn't a good news. So crypto, as we, we see, uh, the, the challenge is, will the central banks give up their currency domination by allowing some third party to run? I mean, technology is the one thing. Uh, everybody agrees we need innovation. Uh, we need advanced technologies. And, and 193 countries run their own currency transactions. And uh, through the Basel, if you see the, uh, the uh, 17 or 18 central bank governors uh, who owns and run the world, uh, maybe it's an alternative. You know, people who believe in, in especially in every Ivy League business school I interact with, <laughs> they're, they're very, they're, there's a segment of the professors who treat Bitcoin and the crypto as a going forward. <clears throat> but as a traditional banker, uh, and as a uh, as a, in the field of finance, you see the more risk because you can't trace the money. You can you don't know where the origin is. Yes. So crypto is definitely maybe it's a, and the blockchain is another area. Uh, how you actually do uh, people do the mining and the mine and very recently the Delaware Corporation started those mining companies, but the rest of the, the mining companies are outside of yes. the U.S. So we, we will not have time to go into the details. If you don't mind, we only yeah, have five right. minutes left. I'm keeping yeah. the line watch. <laughs> so that's and I just want to, yes, yes, look, I, I got your, I got your, um, uh, you know, uh, insights into this very controversial topic at the moment. Yes, because I personally don't agree with everything what you said, but this is, uh, we will have another conversation about that. Yes. Um, uh, you know, in the last five minutes, I wanted to give each of you the opportunity to make a closing statement. But before this, you know, I also wanted to throw out there an observation which I made during this panel. Uh, starting with Ramesh, we mentioned uh, the fractured world being caused partly because of the have and have not situation which we have in the case of artificial intelligence with data, right? I mean, not everybody has access to the data. And in the case of space tech, yes, the Bezos is of the world and what Felix was saying, the richest will have access for now. So uh, this is something which I take with me from what I hear the panelists saying. But I'm hoping that each of you will make a closing, sta closing statement that will make me forget this and be more hopeful for the future. I will start with Ramesh. Uh, thank you, Mihaela. I think what's important to remember is as, as, as Nak said with the cryptocurrency, as Felix says about space, you know, things that appear kind of a rich man's problem and a rich man's technology over time percolate down and, you know, impact everyone. So space might sound like this, something that's far out and doesn't have to be inclusive, could be exploitative, you know, as we heard from Richard. Uh, but over time, that's going to play a role uh, in everybody's life uh, in, in other ways, through telecom, through imaging, through prediction, uh, and so on. So if you can bake in some of the inclusivity features uh, into that, I mean, I know Nag is, you're, you're, you know, you're a leader in the ESG space. Um, and some of those principles should be should go into all the emerging and frontier technologies, not just in technologies that people already use. And we think we have the solution notion of a benevolent AI, which is part of my research here at MIT of how do you create you know AI that's automatically privacy preserving yes. and fair. Thank you so much. Next, I will go to Felix. Closing. Okay, I think. Um, one topic we haven't touched upon much today, uh, but I think it's going to be the topic of, uh, uh, you know, over the next 20, 30 years is climate change. Uh, 
if we don't solve climate change, you know, the, what we think is a fractured world today will not resemble anything we're going to see in the next 20, 30, 40 years with hundreds of millions, if not billions of people uh, having to leave their existing home and existing country because they just can't live there anymore physically. So that's the focus that we need to really have in mind for everything we're doing in technology. And obviously space technology is an area that can really help there. One of our portfolio companies in, in our space fund is effectively observing uh, rainforest uh, destruction in the Amazon as we speak and giving that information in real time to law enforcement. So whatever we can do, there are many, many different examples, but we have to remember if we don't solve climate change, all the conflicts we know today, including those that I mentioned earlier in Afghanistan, and are going to be much, much worse going forward. So let's really make sure all our thinking, all our technology development focuses on that one, on that one key issue that we need Thank to focus on. Thank you so on. much. Yes, indeed. And from my perspective, we touched on that because when I mentioned in the beginning, as soon as I heard Ramesh about that AI, which gives me the insight about at the global level, what's going on, then I can see. So that is already, you know, the mindset is going there and is changing me as well and my behavior. Uh, we have, you know, we, 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 yes, we are greedy, but we are also innate with a sense of justice and also with a sense of self-preservation. And we are aware that if this planet does not survive, we will not. So I am hopeful in that regard. Richard, please. And now we, we will have the last word. So <laughs> just to be ready. Uh, cannot hear you somehow. I don't know. Yeah, on mute. Yeah, technology, right? No yes, yeah, technology. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm an optimist when it comes to technology development. You know, I'm more of the, hey, we can make uh, atomic energy work for us as opposed to atomic bombs. Yeah, I know you've got both. But I think that uh, the amount of – the big changes that are going to happen, like, like Felix just said, climate change, and these are going to require massive amounts of artificial intelligence being put onto the problems because you can't solve them or even know what the questions are unless you do that. Another field is proteomics. It makes genomics look like child's play, right? Um, automated electric vehicles. I'm hoping that in 10 years' time when I go to New York City or something, I'm not going to see any big old plunkers anymore. I'm just going to get in a little electric car. I'm going to dial it up and I'm just going to go and all those big multi-story parking stacks have all gone and been turned into multi-story indoor farms you know with big nice produce stores in the bottom of them um i think you're going to see amazing things that are going to change the way the world operates uh, instantaneous translators i i have my headphones in i'm talking to you you're speaking mandarin i'm speaking english and yours is instantly translated into my head bringing us together change the yes. world <laughs> right that will change the world more than anything because language is the most common bound you know, it's more it's a more tight bind than religion so that's the way i see it wonderful thank you so much and nag please thank you thank you the great panel discussion we talked about the esg space and the academia i bet on the quantum computing which is going to revolutionize the ai and the future of how we we see technology and probably we don't behave like a machines in the future, but machines will definitely enable us uh, for a better tomorrow. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all also for being here with us. And I'm really sorry we don't have time for questions. I get a message that our original se session time has elapsed. <laughs> so I have to, to cut it here. But thank you so much. I am leaving uplifted and with a lot of hope for the future that technology can indeed help us save us from ourselves thanks Mahela. bye bye thank you thank you, thank you all bye. Bye. fantastic thank you hey naga that was a great session thank you wonderful we'll catch up again i'll take my phone number or we'll connect later in the evening or whenever you have the time yeah yeah let's uh, I, I think